2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And the King James text today reads, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. I want to talk today on the topic simply stated. Simply stated. 2 Corinthians 11, 1-4. If you bow your heads with me a moment. Father, once again, God, we come boldly, boldly, boldly before the throne of grace. As the Word of God declares, it's our privilege as children of God, and it is our privilege because you have made us holy. You have sanctified us and justified us through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And therefore, Lord, we need not come meekly. We need not come quietly. We need not come fearfully before the throne of grace. But we can run into the room and cry out, Daddy! Abba, Father! Daddy! I need you to help me. Oh, glory! Ira bondora shitara yakoma. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. Mm, come unto me and I will receive you, saith the Lord. Fear not. For I am your father. I have no desire to judge or condemn you. But rather I seek only to love you, to embrace you, to feel the warmth of your love. Come to me at this hour, saith your father. For I am a God of love and a God of grace. And I will receive you, saith the Most High. Master, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord, for the move of God. Thank you for the gifts of the Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Touch your servant today, God. Touch. Touch me. Touch me. Touch me. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost pour over me like warm oil at this very hour. Oh, Master, in the name of Jesus, let me deliver this important word. Let me deliver it in the power of the Holy Ghost, in the authority of a child of the King, in the love of God that people might receive and hear it gladly to the salvation of their soul, to the reclaiming of their walk with God, to the reconciliation of their faith. 
Oh, Master, touch every ear that hears, that every heart today might be receptive to the engrafted Word of God. Let it not fall as rain upon a tin roof, but rather, O oh God, let it fall upon a thirsty, dry ground, that we might receive it to the nourishment of our souls and the benefit of that seed of faith which you planted in our heart at the moment of conversion. We ask it all today, O oh Master, and none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth, he said, I hope you folks will understand the way that I am saying this. You know, sometimes the preacher uses illustrations and I hope that people get it when I'm, I preached recently a message I remember, and I remember saying, now folks, I hope you'll get what I'm about to do. I hope you'll understand. And I compared the word of the Lord talking about Jesus being the creator of the world in, first, uh, in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it goes on to say He was in the world, and He created the world, and the world knew Him not. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. And I compared that to a stage and to a, a production, a play. And I was trying to help you understand the concept of God entering his own creation to become the creator in the same way as one who writes a play and then acts as the main character in that play. He created not only the play on paper, not only did he speak the word, but he also created the stage. And the title of my message, as you might recall, was All the World is a Stage. But I told folks, I said, try to understand. I'm going to make a metaphor of this passage. Well, Paul is here saying to the church at Corinth, I hope you'll understand the spirit and the intent with which I'm saying what I'm about to say. That's why he said, I would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. That's what he's basically saying. Says, I hope you can understand the way I'm about to say what I'm about to say. He said, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. He's saying, I care about you people so much. And I'm concerned about anyone or anything that would try to steal you away from me. For I have espoused you to one husband. He said, I am in many ways like a spiritual dad to you all. And I have arranged for you to be married to a man, to one husband. He said that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He said, folks, I'm doing everything in my power so that when the Lord comes, you'll be ready. And you'll not just be ready, but you'll be shiny and pretty. Hallelujah. You'll be everything God wants you to be. He said, I'm jealous of you. Oh, I don't want anybody tearing you away from me. I don't want anybody stealing you away from me so that I won't be able to walk you down the aisle and present you to the Lord Jesus Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah! As a chaste virgin. That's what Paul is here saying. But then he goes on in verse 3 to say, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so your minds should be corrupted, listen, from the 
simplicity that is in Christ. I want to tell you folks, this gospel is pretty simple. It is not complicated. Man has taken the word of God. They have taken the gospel of Jesus Christ and they have enlarged it. They have perverted it. They have twisted it. They have misrepresented it. They have created religion out of a faith that is simple. My God, to become a Catholic priest, you've got to go to seminary and learn all they didn't have a thing in the world to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tradition. Man-made doctrine and dogma. Got news for you. To become a Southern Baptist preacher, you got to do the same thing. You got to go to school and be taught to think how they want you to think, to interpret the Word of God as they want you to interpret the Word of God. I wanted, as a young man, I wanted nothing more in this world. God called me to preach when I was eight years old. <coughs> I wanted to be able to go to Bible college. I wanted to be able to go to seminary. I was born and raised in the Pentecostal church, but I wanted to be as uh, properly prepared for the work of ministry as I could possibly be prepared. And the Spirit of the Lord told me when I was quite young, He told me, He said, You will not ever be able to go to school for ministry. He told me that. You know what I did? I fought him tooth and toenail. There were about three different times in my life that I did everything in my power to see if I couldn't go to a Bible college anyway in spite of the Lord having told me that. Because that's how much I wanted to do it. My motivations were pure. I wanted to make certain that I was properly prepared for the work of ministry. I, I didn't want to go into the ministry and not be properly prepared and properly equipped. But the Lord telling me at a young age, I might have been 10, 11 or so when he told me that. Him telling me that at a young age motivated me though. I was a big fan as a kid of certain historical figures. And one of my biggest uh, figures that I adored was Abraham Lincoln. Oh, I was a big fan of Abraham Lincoln. And I remember reading how that Abraham Lincoln became a lawyer and was able to uh, literally pass the bar and become a lawyer. And never did he go to college. Never did he go to law school. But he was able to do this all through self-learning. And so when the Lord told me this, I said, well, if God's telling me I'm never going to be able to go to a Bible school, then I'm going to do everything in my power, like Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to do everything in my power to learn everything I can learn uh, outside of school. I'm going to teach myself. I'm going to devote myself to the Word of God, not to books not to people's opinions and people's thoughts. Yes, I read in a number of books on theological subjects, uh, but they, the books do not form my belief system. The Word of God does. Believe me, there are many things I've read in books over the years that I've said, sorry, author, but I don't buy that. Sorry, author, but I don't agree with you on that particular point. I could go down a list of all kinds of examples of what I mean when I say that, but I won't. 
but I devoted myself to studying the Word of God as, as passionately and as carefully as I possibly could. And then when I was about 12, I'll never forget it so long as I live, I was in my bedroom at my parents' house and I was I had the only bedroom that was down in the basement level it was a raised ranch house and I was the only one that had a bedroom in the basement and I used to spend hours and hours and hours down there studying and praying and one day I was down there and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart and said do you know what you're gonna preach Boy, I was cocky. I was so confident. I said, oh, yes, Lord, I know the message that I'm going to preach. I was born and raised in the assemblies of God. I'm third generation Pentecost. I know exactly what I'm going to preach. And the next words that came back to me shook me to my core. Because the words that the Spirit of the Lord spoke back to me was, No, you don't. People want to think, Oh, you're just talking to yourself. That's just you talking to yourself. Honey, I'm going to tell you, I don't know where on earth that thought would come from if that was just me talking to myself. But the voice of the Spirit said to me, no, you don't. And that's all he said. And I was so troubled by those words. Those words literally had me shaken up, literally, for years. Not for a few days, not for a couple of weeks or months, but for years those words haunted me. But then... The Lord started me on a journey at 16 years old. He said, I'm bringing his, I want you to go to Texas. He said, I'm going, I'm going to prepare you for your ministry. And he brought me to Texas. And when I came to Texas, I went into the church of God and I, I uh, immersed myself in what is referred to as the holiness movement. And uh, there were many wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things that I learned during that time. I wound up under a marvelous man of God and he taught me so much about the move of God and allowing the Holy Ghost to have his way and allowing God to move in the service. Brother Gillum told me one time, he said, Chuck, if the Holy Ghost start moving in the church services here, you just get out of the way and let God do what God's doing. He said, there ain't nothing you can do better than God can do it. He said, if the Spirit starts to move in the service, he said, then God is wanting to heal people. God's wanting to deliver people. God's wanting to fill people with the Holy Ghost. God's wanting to touch people and encourage them. God's wanting to bring people out of depression and despair. Just let the Holy Ghost do what the Holy Ghost is doing. Because, honey, they ain't no way in the world you're going to be able to do all that as well as God can. And I learned being in that old time Pentecostal, Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking, fire baptized church where the Holy Ghost would fall like rain. I literally saw services, literally, where just like I started the service with prayer, you know, Brother Gillum got in the pulpit and he just said, we're going to open the service with prayer. And if you all knew Brother Gillum, you'd know I do a really, really good uh, in imitation of him. He was very country and he kind of talked in this way. He didn't fully enunciate everything, you know. But he got up and he said, We're well, going to open the service in prayer. Believe God and move in the service today. And Lord Jesus, and he started praying, just praying like I do at the beginning of service. And he started praying. And as he was praying, 
the Spirit of the Lord fell on the church. He, he was opening the service. No cheerleading. He wasn't up there trying to rile up the crowd. He was praying a simple opening prayer. And the Holy Ghost literally fell on the church. And all of a sudden, I mean to tell you, whoo, people begin to get up out of their seat and raise their hands toward heaven and worship God. And all of a sudden, you heard people let out with a whoop and a holler. You heard people start to shout. You saw men start to run the aisles. You saw ladies start to dance in the spirit. Oh my God, have mercy. You saw people leaping up and down. Oh, you saw people just begin and to feel the presence and the power of God all over that room. Hundreds of people at one single time. And all Brother Gilman was doing was opening the service with prayer. I saw services in that church where the Spirit of the Lord began to move. And every teenager in the building, every young person in that building made their way down to the altars and began. Nobody was talking to the teenagers. Nobody was asking the teenagers to come down to the altar. This was all spontaneous. All the young people, for some reason, by the direction and the orchestration of the Holy Ghost, all these young people began to make their way down to the altars and begin to pray. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move. And honey, before it was done, there was not one teenager, not one teenager in that building that wasn't shouting or dancing or running the aisles and having church. And it was just a sovereign act of God. That particular service, the Lord was ministering specifically to the young people. But there was nothing about that service that was aimed at the young people. There was nothing about that service that was special toward the, the young people. No, it was just the sovereign act of God. I learned a lot of great stuff about the move of God and what God is capable of and how we need to worship in spirit and in truth and how we need to learn to let, to not only let the Spirit of the Lord move, but to be hungry for the Spirit of the Lord to move and to, to desire that the Spirit of God move when you come together as God's church. Do I believe everything today? that I believed then? No, I do not. There are several things, many things that I believe differently today than I did then. But there are many arrows in my quiver today that I attained during that time. You follow what I'm saying? Then after that, I wound up some years later, the Spirit of the Lord led me into the one God, Jesus' name, apostolic movement. And now my beliefs changed even more and things changed even more. I'm still in the Pentecostal. I'm still in the Spirit-filled vein. But I'm in a very different, you know, uh, structure of theology, if you want to call it that. But the whole point I'm trying to make is this. As a 12-year-old, the Lord knew, now, nah, you don't know what you're going to preach. <laughs> You think you know what you're going to preach. 
But see, I already know that I've got a path plotted out for you that's going to take you to a very different place. And the message you will ultimately preach is not the message that you've got in your head right now. It is not the message you grew up with. It is not what you think you know. But this gospel is so simple, folks. At its heart and at its core, it is the simplest message in the world. It is not complicated. Mormonism is complicated. Catholicism is complicated. Baptist theology is complicated. Hate to say it, but a lot of Pentecostal theology has complicated things. But this message of the gospel, Paul said, I'm concerned that somehow the same way that Satan led Eve astray through subtlety, See, it's not always in your face. It's not always bright and bombastic. Sometimes it is just very subtle cues that will cause one to err. How many people aren't in church today? Not because the pastor got up and said, You're LGBT. You have no place in our church. Get out of our church. We don't want you. Now that's happened to many. But how many are out of church for the reason of subtleties? Well, people in the church looked at me funny. I knew they knew. I just felt like they, oh my Lord have mercy, very subtle cues and yet it made these people act in a very serious manner. They left the church over some of the most subtle cues that made them feel unwelcome, that made them feel unloved, that made them feel unaffirmed that made them feel as though they were not included. And it's not always bombastic. Sometimes it's subtle. And Paul said, I'm concerned that even through some subtlety, somebody's going to take you away from the simplicity that is in Christ. I loved his next statements. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached. I got news for you, my friend. 85% of the churches in Huntsville, Alabama today are not preaching the same Jesus the apostles preached. Because the Jesus they preach is hateful, judgmental, critical, nasty, that's not the Jesus Paul preached. That's not the Jesus Peter preached. That's not the Jesus the apostles preached. Am I telling the truth today? He said, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received. I'm going to tell you something. I watched Franklin Graham preach. I watched Rod Parsley preach. I watched Kenneth Copeland preach. And I don't feel the same spirit emanating from these men and from their message that I know to be the right spirit. I hear hatefulness, I hear anger, I hear angst, I hear vitriol, I hear judgment. Honey, got news for you. That's not the same spirit that Paul came to the church with. That's not the same spirit John came to the church with. He said, or another gospel which ye have not accepted. 
Hmm. I know a lot of churches today don't preach the same gospel Paul preached. I know a lot of churches today don't preach the same. Oh, they preach from the same book. But sweetheart, you can take any one passage out of this book and make it say about anything you want it to say. You know why I don't argue with dinglings who come to me and they want to argue about, well, the Bible says this about homosexuals. The Bible says this about this or this about that. You know why I'm not going to argue with them? Because they want to argue about a passage. Mm -hmm. Uh oh. Because I know if you're going to understand this book the way God wants you to understand this book, I preach it all the time. You hear me constantly say it. The Word of God tells us line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I know that I'm not going to argue a passage with you because like I said, you can take any passage, make it say whatever you want to make it say. But I know what the message is, not in part, but in whole. I know how that passage fits in with the whole of the puzzle. I'm not just looking at the piece, I'm looking at the entire thing. You hear what I'm telling you now? When we did our Bible study, LGBT Affirming Theology, one of the first topics I covered that I must tell you, honestly, most LGBT Affirming uh, preachers and teachers that I've ever heard, not a one of them, not a one of them has ever gone in the direction in their teaching that I go when I teach on it. They do just like that Southern Baptist ninny who wants to argue over a point. They go to this scripture. They go to that scripture. Oh, we're going to address the clobber passages. Hallelujah. And they go scripture by scripture and they try to redefine it and they try to re-explain it and they try to reinterpret it. When got news for you, that's entirely unnecessary when it comes to every passage in the Old Testament, number one. If it's found in the book of law, then it falls into one category. It has one design, one purpose, one meaning. And that's it, period doesn't apply to anybody outside of the Jewish faith to start with. So why in the world do you stand there trying to re-explain it and try to reinterpret it? Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you today? But see, that's how people do. Because they're gagging at gnats and swallowing camels. They're not carefully dissecting and understanding the Word of God as a whole going to tell you something the message of the gospel as a whole is quite simple but if you're going to try to break down every little tiny passage and make every little thing say something of its own you wind up with all kinds of conflict you wind up with all kinds of items that do not agree with one another if I had a nickel for every dingling, I've heard talk about how the church is called, we're supposed to judge, we're supposed to judge, we're supposed to, don't you know we're going to sit in judgment of angels one day? Hallelujah. And that's how they justify sitting in judgment of one another 
in the church. And yet, Jesus said, Judge not, lest you be judged, for with the same measure with which you judge, you shall be judged. You know why they do that, Booby? You know why they take that one passage and they run with it? Because they are not taking the whole. They're not looking at the whole. They're not understanding that in some passages the word judge means to sit and, and, and uh, issue a verdict on an issue. Whereas in other passages the word judge means you're standing at a street corner looking both ways trying to judge whether or not you can safely cross the road. There's a difference. But you get those who see one word and they interpret that word everywhere they read it the same way. And then they have the gall to tell the unbeliever who says to them, the Bible is full of contradictions. And they say, oh no it doesn't. There's no contradiction. Oh talk to any Southern Baptist. No, there are no contradictions in the Bible. My God, yes there are. The way you preach it, it's nothing but contradiction. Because you've complicated the simplicity of the gospel. But simply stated, listen to me now, 1 John chapter 1. Verses 5 through 10. John, the apostle whom Jesus loved. Listen to what John wrote. This then is the message which we have heard of him, meaning Jesus, and declare unto you. Oh, simply stated. Here's the message. That God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Oh, listen, children, this is the message. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and walk in darkness, we lie, and do not the truth. Listen, but if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. This is the message. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This is the message. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the message. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and, the, and his word is not in us. John is not talking about sinners and unbelievers because we know that they don't claim to have God's word in them, do they? Paul, excuse me, John's talking about believers. And John says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Simply stated, this is the message, folks. We're all sinners saved by grace. Amen. We all flub up, mess up, goof up, screw up every single day of our lives, but God has made a simple means for us to receive forgiveness of sin and that means is simply confession he said if you just acknowledge it <laughs> then i'll wipe it away all you have to do is acknowledge it 
I come into the church. I'm not busy trying to explain this scripture. I'm not busy trying to explain that scripture. I'm not busy trying to tell God how this one's been misunderstood. That one's been misunderstood many times. That is the truth, folks. But I come into the house of God, and I'm like that one man the Word of God talks about. Jesus spoke of two men. He said there was a publican who came into the temple and he looked up and said Lord I thank thee that I'm not like these other sinners I pay tithes I do good I'm charitable he said and then the other fella looked down toward the ground and said Lord have mercy on me a sinner he said which one of them do you think went home justified See, I come to church. I'm going to tell you the attitude when I come to I come to church every Sunday and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen. That's the attitude I come into church with. I say, Lord, I'm doing my best. I'm trying my hardest. I want to serve you. I want to be a witness and a testimony to a lost and dying world. But God, do I mess up. Lord, do I ever screw up. Do I ever fail you? How often do I say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, act the wrong way? So, Lord, all I can do in coming into the house of God is acknowledge my sin. And my God said, if you'll confess your sin, He is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. This is the message simply stated. 1 John chapter 3, same author, verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning that we should love one another. You can't hate church folks, honey. No, nope, you can't hate God's people. I don't care. They can act wrong. They can act stupid. But you can't hate on them. You got to be able to love them anyway. Nobody said you had to go to church with them. You can find another church. But you can't hate them. You can't hold anger. You can't hold bitterness. You can't hold resentment in your heart toward them. It doesn't work. This is the message that you heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. Romans 10, 4 through 13, the Apostle Paul writes, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that acteth perfect, to everyone that obeyeth every rule, keepeth every law. No, it's not what it says. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring up Christ again from the dead but what saith it the word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, listen, which we preach. Simply stated, I'm going to put simply stated in here. Verse number 9, Romans 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, 
thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, listen, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Folks, how much more simply can I state it? He said, this is the message that we preach. <laughs> Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. The word perfection here means maturity or completion. He said, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. What is the foundation of our faith? What is the bottom line? Paul just said it right there. He said, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So there's the foundation right there. It's pretty simple. Simply stated, it's pretty simple. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. I challenge you today, I'd be willing to bet that out of all the churches in America this afternoon that had church probably this morning and may have church again this evening, out of all the churches in America, I guarantee you that we are one of precious few spirit-filled, tongue-talking, fire-baptized, Holy Ghost-filled churches that actually sang at the cross or at Calvary, I should say this afternoon we still sing the old songs we still sing the songs that celebrate the cross hallelujah we still sing the songs that celebrate the blood oh we don't just get up there and sing the i love you jesus lord you're wonderful oh you're such a nifty needle ipsy whoopsy god yahoo jesus hallelujah yahoo hallelujah yahoo. all that foolishness Say, preacher, I don't like your worship service. Well, I'm sorry for you. Because I'm going to tell you something. The song we sang today that didn't bless my soul. The one, the song we sang today that didn't have a message in it that meant something to me. But you go to most spirit-filled churches today and they're so busy with their so-called praise and worship music that they don't even talk about the cross. They don't even reference the blood. You'll hear that here. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved 
It is the power of God. Honey, I'm going to tell you there ain't nothing in this church that is more powerful and more potent and more celebrated, glory to God, than the cross of Calvary. Amen. And we preach the cross. Mm -hmm. Why? Because simply stated, this is our message. Finally today, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 8. Moreover, brethren, listen, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. You remember Paul said in our primary text, if they preach another gospel which ye have not accepted. Remember in verse number 4, 2 Corinthians 11, now he's saying, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. This is the gospel. Simply stated, this is the gospel. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. He said, verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas Peter then of the twelve after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are falling asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Paul said, this is the gospel. <laughs> He said, this is the gospel I preach to you. This is the gospel that you received. How many churches today are not preaching this gospel? How many are so busy preaching how you can be rich? How many are so busy preaching how you can be prosperous? How many are so busy preaching America needs to turn back to God? How many are so busy preaching, oh, let's worship Donald Trump? How many are preaching messages, my friend, that have nothing to do with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because simply stated, that is our message. LGBT believer, I got news for you. Somebody has beguiled you through subtlety and convinced you that there's more to this gospel than there is. There's been a bait and switch pulled on many people, not just gay, lesbian people. A lot of people have experienced the bait and switch. Oh, the preacher gets up and preaches with tears in his eyes. Come to Jesus. Oh, he loves you. Oh, God's grace is there for you. Oh, come to Jesus. Hallelujah. And people weeping make their way down to the altar. In some churches, they shake the preacher's hand. Now they're saved. Some churches, they repeat the sinner's prayer. A formula nowhere found in the Word of God. And nowhere do we ever see that practiced in the New Testament. 
but now they declare themselves to be saved because the preacher says they're saved. But they beg you to the altar promising you grace, telling you of God's love. And then the very next Sunday, all of a sudden the message changes. And it's all about you're going to miss heaven unless you can be perfect. You're not going to make heaven unless you can change this about yourself. Unless you can change that about yourself. Unless you can do something you can't do or be something you can't be. And I'm here to tell you today, simply stated, that is not our message. Paul said, whosoever, 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 whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Hallelujah. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, children of God today, understand me. Straight, gay, cross-eyed, and blind. It doesn't matter what your life circumstance. It doesn't matter what your situation. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you believe. And if you believe this gospel according to John, automatically you're going to love those who, like you, believe this gospel. That is one of the, not requirements, no, it's one of the manifestations. Once you're born again, born of the water, born of the Spirit, born again the Bible way, guess what? You're going to find yourself completely unable to not love those who, like you, have been born again. And if you can't go to a church where people have all kinds of idiotic ideologies and all kinds of twisted and perverted theology, got news for you, Huntsville, Alabama. There's a church here in Alabama you can come to. And you will find people who will love you, people who will support you, people who will encourage you, people who will do everything in their power to be there for you. Because the only thing we want is to see you make heaven. And the one thing we know simply stated is this. You don't have to achieve some level of perfection. To be raptured on resurrection morning. You have to keep your faith intact to the very end. Because the enemy is not concerned with what he can make you do. The enemy is concerned with what he can make you believe. Because if your belief is wrong, your actions will follow. If your beliefs are right, guess what? Your actions will follow. Why do you think he said to Eve in the garden? Remember, Paul said, I'm concerned that somebody will lead you away from the simplicity that is in Christ through the beguilement as, as uh, Satan beguiled Eve in the garden. How did he beguile her? Did he say, go ahead, eat the apple, have the apple. Go ahead, the apple won't hurt you. Go ahead. Is that what he said? No. He said, oh, did God say that you shouldn't eat that apple? Did God say that in the day of, uh, thou eatest of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die? He said, oh no, God knows that if you eat that apple, you're going to be as God's. What was he trying to do? Was he trying to get them to eat the apple or was he trying them to disbelieve God and believe what he was saying instead? He was trying to get them to believe what he was saying instead. Why? Because if they believe what he's saying, what are they going to do? They're going to eat the apple. Do you follow what I'm saying? Or eat the fruit. We don't know that it was an apple. Oh, children, I'm here to tell you today. Simply state it. There is room at the cross for you. Simply stated, 
this gospel is about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply stated, if you have obeyed the message of the gospel preached by the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for this promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. If you have pulled up to the table and become a born again child of God all you need to do from this day forward the apostle Paul said is this that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved how do you keep your salvation? You have to confess and believe. Period. Simply stated. That is our message. Hallelujah.